In verse number three, the Bible says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Call unto me, Jeremiah 33, 3. We know the verse by heart, many of us. Call unto me, and I'll answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things. Well, that sounds good. Great and mighty things which thou <clears throat> knowest not. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be in church tonight. And, uh, Lord, for the moments that we have together, Lord, we've gathered, we've assembled, uh, we've driven. Many of us have come straight from work. Uh, we've not yet eaten any food, but yet we've come to the house of God, Lord, to be with the people of God. And, uh, Lord, I do pray that you'd meet with us tonight. Do a work in our hearts. Our desire is to hear the voice of God. And uh, we often wonder why. Why do I not hear the voice of God in our hearts and our lives? And uh, we're learning some things tonight. Again, another bl uh, brick upon brick, another um, a block upon block, Lord, as we look at the, uh, the ingredients you tell us and how we can hear the voice of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You, you, you already see it. Okay. Uh, we're looking at the acronym tonight. <clears throat> as we began last week, the acronym LISTEN. L-I-S-T-E-N. It's interesting. The word LISTEN has the same letters as the word SILENT. And uh, so there's an important part of listening and being silent. Uh, oftentimes when we're uh, conversing with someone or sometimes debating or arguing with someone, we're not really listening. We're thinking of our response, aren't we? We're thinking about how to uh, come back, and uh, we're not silent and still and listening. And so we're looking tonight at why can't I hear God's voice. When we talk about hearing the voice of God, uh, we're not talking about an audible voice. And that God doesn't speak through an audible voice. There's no need for God to do that. He's given us His Word. The Word of God gives us all the direction that we need. And uh, the Holy Spirit of God lives within us to help interpret and uh, give us insight and guidance and direction, direct us uh, in the way of righteousness. And so uh, we have all that we need to be able to hear from God. And, and so we want to make sure that we're truly tuned in to the voice of God so that we can hear uh, what God says. God, as we looked at this verse here uh, tonight, uh, God wants to know uh, and wants us to know that we can hear his voice. He's not some mysterious thing to where he just sort of is trying to hide from us and doesn't want us to hear his voice. He wants to be uh, heard. He wants to guide and direct our lives. Uh, but until you hear uh, the word of God, uh, it cannot benefit you, as we saw in uh, John chapter 8 last week. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And so God is not a silent God. God is a God that's always speaking to us, but we're not always listening. And uh, we use the example of a, of a radio, transistor radio. There's always... Um, signals and, and the things in the, in the airwaves. Uh, you've got the, the video signals and the, and the radio signals and the cellular signals and the signals and all this in the air. But unless you have that uh, receptor, that transmitter on your radio or on your television or on your phone, you're not going to be able to pick up those things. We've got on our um, mic, on the, on the lapel we've got, uh, we've got, I don't know, there's like a hundred and some channels that we can attune through to find a, ch a channel that's not tuned into the truck stop over here. We've had sometimes, you know, you're preaching and, you know, break a break of one nine and, and uh, got to change channels or, or something. And so there's, there's signals all in the air, all through the air, uh, but we want to have the right receptor. We have the Holy Spirit of God, which is that right uh, receiver to hear the voice of God. The Bible says, my, my sheep uh, hear my voice and they follow me and they know me. And so uh, we want to be a, a, a follower of Christ that knows and hears the voice of God. And so hearing God's voice uh, is a journey that we go on uh, in a relationship as we grow in our Christian life. It's a journey. And so when you first become a Christian, it's not something that all of a sudden, oh, I'm hearing the voice of God. It's a growing relationship. And so uh, the Bible calls it sanctification. Uh, sanctification is the growth process of us as Christians where we're becoming more sanctified, set apart from the world unto God. And the more sanctified we become, that's spiritual growth, then the more we're going to be in tune to hearing the voice of God. And then the ultimate, then the after sanctification is glorification. That's when we're taken to heaven and uh, you know, we get uh, out of this old sinful uh, body and, and flesh and things that we have. But during that time that we're in now uh, is that time of spiritual growth. And so we're, we're looking at several psalms 
in the Bible of, of a template that God gives us, different verses uh, in these Psalms of how we can learn to hear the voice of God. And again, we're not looking for something audible or, you know, yay, Lord, you know, what are you saying up there? And we're not talking, God doesn't work that way. Uh, and so we're looking at the several. So we looked at the first two. <clears throat> L for listen uh, was to leave the noise behind. Leave the noise behind. And we looked at Psalm 131 and looked at uh, several uh, verses about there. Be still and know that I am God and, and I'll be exalted among the heathen. And uh, we saw where uh, Moses took the, spoke to the Israelites and uh, said, take heed. That means to observe quietly and to hearken. That means to pay careful attention to. And so he said, I want you to listen quietly and I want you to really listen on purpose be attentive to what I want to want you to want you to hear. What I'm telling you. As a result, uh, we also saw when uh, the Red Sea uh, stopped and the Hebrews progressed across on dry ground. <clears throat> Moses reassured them uh, in Exodus 14, 14, the Lord shall fight for you, and and ye shall hold your peace. But mainly, he was just saying, I want you to be quiet. And we go across this thing, don't be giving your opinions, don't be giving your ideas, let God do what only God can do. And uh, so often we try to play God and we get in trouble and uh, we, we get mad at God because God didn't do it the way we thought he would do it, but God was doing a great job until we interjected and got in the midst of things and failed to hold our peace. And so when he says uh, to the children of Israel, <clears throat> be, be, hold your peace, he said, I want you to be silent. I want you to be able to be still. The next letter that we saw last week was the letter I. And that means to incline your heart. Psalm 119, 112 says, I've inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. And that word uh, incline is a, is a very interesting word. It means to lean into. You're in a crowded room. A lot of noise going on. You're trying to hear the story of the person you're talking to. Uh, but you can't quite make out all the words that they're saying. So you lean in. You maybe put your ear right next to their voice. And, and uh, you want to hear what they're saying. It's important to you. And you want to listen to every word. You incline your ear. We also saw uh, that that word incline deals with the tightening <coughs> of, the, of the, the bow string on a bow and arrow. Uh, to make sure that there be an accurate uh, an accuracy of that arrow as it was shot, not some flimsy uh, string that's going to not have the accuracy. And then we also saw that uh, to incline is also not only tightening the bow of an arrow, but it's also tightening the strings on an instrument and uh, making sure that everything is in tune, in harmony uh, with, with the thing. So you're inclining your ear, uh, and that word ear also is tied to a musical uh, term. As we say, we often use the term he, he you know, plays with his ear, and uh, you know, he doesn't read music, we imply with that, uh, but he just plays by ear and just sort of allows his ear to be tuned in to that. And so the, the more we pay attention uh, to the voice of God, the more we spend time with God, the more we're going to be in tune with God. And you're going to know and hear the voice of God because you're tuned in. You're tuned in. <clears throat> so many of us are not tuned in to the Word of God and the voice of God, and we're tuned into everything else. We're tuned out, God, and we're not tuned into that. And we saw several other verses that that's one of the greatest uh, frustrations of God or, or areas of sadness for our, our, our God uh, is that the people just won't listen uh, to what he says. He said, I've got something that'll help your life. I've got something that'll guide you. I've got something that'll protect you. And I got something that'll be for your benefit, but they just won't hear. All right, now the next letter, and we'll get through these tonight. <clears throat> We've got plenty of time. We'll get right through these. Uh, there's not a lot of length of, of topic on each of these subjects, but the letter S uh, is uh, found in Psalm 139. So let's go to Psalm 139. Again, these are just some outlines or a template uh, that God gives us in the books of Psalms, uh, the various Psalms, that we can learn uh, how to um, uh, hear the voice of God. In Psalm 139, <clears throat> verse number 23 and 24, the letter S stands for this, submit your thoughts to God. Submit your thoughts to God. So we've got to leave all distractions, all right? You've got to leave all the noise uh, that's in, in your life. Get rid of that. Uh, you've got to incline I, incline your heart to God. And so God's saying you've got to really want to hear the voice of God. I'm not going to just speak to you just because it's just a random thing. You've got to put out some effort. You've got to uh, leave, leave off some of the noise of your life. You've got to draw near to me, and I'll draw nigh to you. And then he says you've got to submit your thoughts uh, unto God. Surrender those thoughts to God. Psalm 139 <clears throat> excuse me, verse number 23 and verse 24, the Bible says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And so God wants us 
to surrender and to submit our thought. There's a lot of information that goes in our minds every day. We've got from notifications to data to just bombarded uh, with all types of voices that come in. And every random thought is going to try to seize uh, your mind so you won't hear the voice of God. And if you're focused on the next thing you've got to do tonight, uh, it makes it very difficult to hear what God's trying to say through the Word of God to you tonight. You've got to be focused. That's the hardest part of praying, is it not? It's not hard to even take time to pray. It's hard to remain focused while you're praying. Because we think about everything that needs to be done under the sun, and i got to do this, and oh, i got to do that. And you're praying. You're spending time with God, and it's no different than going to a restaurant with your wife or your husband, and the whole time you're there, you're on your phone, and uh, you're so distracted, there's no interaction between your, you and your spouse, and uh, we're often that way in our time with God in prayer is that uh, you don't have a phone there but our mind is just as distracted and God's on one side of the table and we're on the other side and we're there to fellowship and commune with God and our minds are going every which way and so God wants us to surrender to submit uh, is the word I'm using submit our thoughts uh, unto God uh, they rush off to the next thing before God even speaks to them you put in your time you put your prayer time in and before you know it you're gone uh, it's, it's you know for example uh, you know uh, the, the, and I mentioned this on Sunday, no one gets right at the altar. The altar is not the place to get right with God. In fact, you cannot get right with God uh, at the altar unless the person that you're at ought with is at the altar next to you, and then you get right with each other while you're at the altar. But the altar is not there to get right with God. It's there to decide to get right with God. That's why some people say, well, how, do you, how can you go to the altar for two or three minutes and get right with God? And how, how does that work out? You can't. You can't uh, live a life of, of uh, uh, the direction we've gone and, and come to the altar and say, well, I got right with God. No, you decided at the altar to get right with God. As soon as you get up and walk out those doors, now you put to practice what you decided at the altar. Are you going to do what you decided at the altar? If not, you didn't decide to get right with God. Uh, it was just some formality that you went through. And so as we look at this thing, submitting our thoughts to God, today is the only place to hear the voice of God. Tomorrow is not the place to hear the voice of God. Today is the day to hear the voice of God. That's why it says now is the acceptance. Today is the day of salvation. Listen, if you want to hear the voice of God, today is the day to hear it. I'm waiting for God to tell me tomorrow. I'm waiting for God to tell me next week. God says, I'm going to tell you right now. Today is a day that God tells us. And so we've got to submit our thoughts to God. The verse says, search me, oh God. Uh, do you pray and ask God to search your heart, to search your, your thoughts? And say, God, uh, you know, I, I'm so self-deceived and uh, I, I'm so blinded to my own imperfections and I'm so uh, not, uh, ignorant to, to my own faults. And we all are. Uh, that's why the best of athletes have a coach. And, uh, you know, the best of golfers that could make a great coach uh, have coaches. Uh, because all of us need someone to be able to help direct us and guide us and point out some of the areas of our life where we're maybe getting in a, in a rut, where we're getting into a slump and, and getting into some bad habits. And so uh, God says, I want you to search me, oh God. And then he says, God, I want you to know my heart. I want you to know my heart because I don't know it because it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? I can't know what my heart's like, but you do. And God, I want you to reveal to me my heart. And he says, I want you to know what? My thoughts. Now that thought, that, 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 that thought about knowing our, our thoughts, um, that's the most private part of our, of our human existence, our thoughts. In fact, we feel that that's a safe place uh, because nobody knows our thoughts and uh, nobody knows what we're thinking. And so it's the most sacred place of us is our thoughts. But you know what? There's a God in heaven that knows your thoughts. And he knows our thoughts of greed. He knows our thoughts of lust. He knows our thoughts of anger. He knows our thoughts of jealousy. He knows our thoughts, and you fill in whatever the blank is, God knows every thought uh, that we think. And you know, when you begin to think about that, that really becomes a little intimidating uh, because God knows everything that goes into our mind and everything that we think upon and everything that we dwell upon. And, and so there's a reason that God says, I want you to submit your thoughts unto me. And then he goes on to say in verse 24, and see... If there be any wicked way in me. And then he says, lead me. You're not led unless you're submissive. Okay, to lead is not to drive. It doesn't say drive me like a herd of cattle. that You're, you're pushing them and driving them. Sheep are led. They're not driven. And, and so the shepherd goes out before them and he says, I want to have a submissive 
heart, uh, submissive uh, thoughts. And, uh, and so David said, I want to be able to follow your lead uh, in the right direction, the right way. And I want to have a submissive heart that will be a good follower of the lead uh, of God in our lives. And uh, so often we resist, and we fight back, and we pull back from that. And David said, it all starts with what? Search me. And to show you that I have a heart that's submissive to you, God, I want you to lead me. And, and to direct my life. And so our thoughts uh, are very, very uh, private parts of our life. And uh, no one can really know our thoughts unless we communicate those thoughts to someone. And even our communication of those thoughts, sometimes we don't communicate them very well. And uh, we can say what we're thinking, but maybe it doesn't come across uh, like we maybe wanted to come across, uh, even in our own communication of it. But God knows our thoughts. You know, uh, of all the things that we think, God knows. The, there's two of the Ten Commandments that deal with your thoughts. Two of the Ten Commandments deal with your thoughts, uh, bringing those thoughts into the right uh, perspective. We see uh, the first commandment uh, says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. No one can know the gods that are before you other than what's in your heart, what's in your thoughts. He's not talking about some idol and some uh, idolatry, you know, some, some pagan altar that you set up on the outside. Long before we erect something on the outside, we've already established an idol in our heart. So he says, have no idols before thee. You don't have other gods before you. What's it? Where it is that? Number one commandment, it deals with what? My thoughts, my thoughts. And then he goes down and gives another commandment on the tenth commandment, the first and the last, uh, and says, thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not covet. Again, covetousness is a thin, sin of the thoughts. And uh, God says it's important how we think. What goes into our mind is so important. Uh, and so much so, I want you to submit your thoughts to God and, and yield those thoughts. See, uh, if your thoughts are not yielded to God, your life is not yielded to God. And you can say, well, I'm going to live my life for God. Yeah, but if your thoughts and your mind are not yielded and surrendered and submitted to God, your thoughts, because as a man thinketh in his heart, what? So the actions, so he is he. And so uh, how I think is, a, is the direction I go. It's how I live. And so the first step of getting a changed life is a change uh, renewed our mind bring everything uh, into captivity there in our thoughts and so it can be intimidating to realize that God knows our thoughts he knows every thought that we think and so if I'm going to hear from God David tells us you better submit your thoughts to God now I've often used this in, in trying to help teenagers find the will of God uh, we often try to find the will of God by coming up with them piece of blank paper and we write down, okay, God, I, I'd like this and this and this and this. And we write down six, eight, ten things of what we would like to do for God. And, uh, and then we give it to God and says, God, would you please sign that and approve that for me because that's what I want to do. And, uh, well, okay, I'll cut that back. And so instead of those six or eight, you bring it back to three or four and says, God, would you approve that? Would you sign that? And God doesn't respond that way. And God says, I want you to sign the blank paper and give me the paper with your signature on it, submit, surrender, and let me fill in the blankness of the page. Let me fill in uh, the boxes. Let me allow the will of God. And so you'll never fulfill the will of God. And you'll never know the will of God until you submit and says, God, not my will, but thy will be done. And so we sign over our right to choose what we want to do and say, God, I want, it's like the little kid. I've told this story so many times. A little kid goes into a, 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 a candy store and, and the, the attendant uh, is there and sees a little kid there and uh, says, son, go ahead, reach your hand there in that candy jar and uh, get all, all the candy that you want. And uh, of course, the little kid didn't move his hand, didn't budge, didn't get anything. And go ahead, son, you can do that. Get, get, he said, you can have some candy, go ahead. And uh, it's free and he wouldn't do it. And uh, later he said, all right, well, just I'll, I'll get it for him. And the store clerk said to the dad, go ahead and get it for him. And so he went outside and so he had the handful of candy and the little kid said, well, he said to his dad, kid, he said, why didn't you get the handful of candy? He said, well, dad, you got a bigger hand than I've got. And I thought that if I had you put the hand in there, I'd get a lot more and that's so enough, he got that. And so God's will will do what? Great and mighty things. Call upon the Lord and let God's hands and let God's will and let God's purpose. But as long as you've got a vote in what you want to do, as long as you've got a desire of one thing you want to accomplish in your life and you don't surrender your thoughts and surrender your ideals and surrender what you want, then God will never be able to direct you and guide you into his will. As he says here, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. I want you to know my thoughts. And uh, it's interesting, uh, God ties the thoughts together with testing and trying. God says, he says, try my thoughts. Uh, you'll know uh, how spiritual you are when things are not going the way you want it to go. And let me tell you what we think about then. 
And the things you think about, the things I think about when I'm being tried, when I'm being tested, when I'm being persecuted, when life isn't fair, when folks are unjust and things are not going the way I want to go and I'm being tried, he says, try me and you'll know the true quality of my thoughts in those very difficult trying times. Anyone can think good thoughts when they're not being tried and tested and proven, but he said, I want you to try my thoughts and I want you to know what I really am under the, 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 the microscope of trials and testings in my life. Then the next one here, we've got so uh, we've got to leave L the noise and the clutter and the, uh, all that kind of stuff. You want to hear the voice of God. And uh, we've got to incline I, uh, your heart to God. Lean in and, and uh, be in tune with God. Submit your thoughts. Uh, don't have a, a voice on what you want to do. Here's what I'm planning to do. All right, there's really no ability to help someone that already knows what they're going to do because they they've already have a, a voice. And they're not surrendered. They're not submitted to what God wants uh, in their life. And so we want to do what God desires. Next one, T, T. We want to turn from our sins. We want to turn from our sins. And again, we're looking at the book of Psalms. So go to <clears throat> Psalm 51. Psalm 51. And uh, I want to hear. Why aren't we hearing the voice of God? Why, why did I not hear the voice of God? Why am I not in tune with the voice of God? Uh, well, it might be because I need to turn from some sin that's not been dealt with in my heart and in my life. Psalm 51 and verse number 10, 11 and 12. Uh, David again says, create in me a clean heart. O God, and renew a right spirit within me. See, when sin is not dealt with rightly, you don't have a clean heart. You don't have a right spirit. And, uh, but David understood, and this took place after the, the act of adultery and after called out by Nathan and brought about, you know, and tried to get everything back on the right track, but the damage has already been done. And this is a prayer that David prays to God as he begins to try to restore that fellowship back with the guy. He says, God, I need a clean heart. And my heart is dirty, it's, it's, it's defiled, and, and I need a right spirit. I don't have a right spirit. I've, I've got a critical spirit. I, I've got a sarcastic spirit. I've got an angry spirit. I've got a jealous spirit. I, I've got a lustful spirit. God, you've got to give me a right spirit. And then he says, cast me not away, verse 11, from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. You see, we resist hearing God when we resist acknowledging the sin that's in our heart that's preventing us to hear God. God, you will not hear God's voice when there's sin in our heart that's preventing us from hearing the voice of God. You'll hear voices, but it won't be the voice of God. You'll hear what you want to hear, but it won't be the voice of God. When we confess our sins and acknowledge the reality of our sinfulness and invite God's forgiveness to be a part of our lives, then we begin to understand what it is to once again hear the voice of God. It's impossible to hear God's voice with an unclean heart. Impossible. It's impossible to hear God's voice with an unclean heart. Look what the Bible says. Take your Bibles and go to Jeremiah. So if you're in Psalms there, just go back a couple more books. Go to Jeremiah where we, uh, previous word, but a little bit different chapter. Jeremiah chapter 6, <clears throat> verse number 10. I've got to have a clean heart to hear uh, the voice of God. And uh, the only thing I'll hear from God with a dirty heart is conviction. Conviction. <clears throat> the chasing hand of God will try to get my attention, but apart from that, uh, I won't hear the voice of God. Jeremiah chapter 6, in verse number 10, the Bible says, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? There's, there's some danger ahead, and there's some uh, bridges that are knocked out, and there's some dangerous, uh, treacherous paths that they're going on, and, and I want to help them and, and speak to them and give them warning, but, but they won't hear. And behold, notice what it says, Their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. Circumci circumcision here is used as a symbol of a clean heart. It was a physical uh, uh, process that the Israelite people would go through, but God transitioned it to a spiritual process uh, to where he talked about the circumcision of your heart and of your ears. And uh, God said, I want you to be able to hear uh, rightly. I want you to hear the voice of God. And so an uncircumcised heart cannot listen. You see what it says? The ear that is uncircumcised, it says cannot hearken. They can't hear. And uh, they don't hear. Well, why? Because they're, they're ear, they've got sin uh, that's not been dealt with in their heart. And uh, they cannot, it's not, not that they don't want to hear. It's not that they're, uh, they're unwilling to hear. They can't uh, hear the voice of God. Go to Jeremiah chapter 4 and look in verse, verse number 4. Jeremiah chapter 4, 
<clears throat> verse number four, again, we see this uh, word that's used in describing uh, our heart and our ears and, and listen to the voice of God. Jeremiah chapter four, verse four says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart. Ye men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doing. And so God says, I want you to get your ears right. I want you to get your heart right. He says, you can't hear. And the reason you can't hear is because you've got that sin that's in your, in your heart and in your life and it's preventing us uh, from hearing the things of God. Uh, you see, if we have a difficult time hearing God's voice, then we need to take an account and see if there's any sin in our lives. And so that's why I said in Jeremiah 4.4, 4, circumcise yourselves. And uh, nobody else can do that for you. You've got to make that choice yourself. You've got to see uh, and turn from your sin because you can hide what's on the inside from everybody else. Uh, but uh, you're not hearing the voice of God. And God says, search me and find out, God, is there anything in my heart that needs to be dealt with when I see it, when you reveal it? Then I want to deal with that thing. I want to excuse it and justify it and put it under the carpet. I want to deal with it head on. Uh, go to Psalm 66, verse number 18. Psalm 66 Verse number 18, it's very different, difficult uh, and uh, dangerous uh, to allow sin uh, to remain in our heart, in our lives, but not uh, without being dealt with. Uh, you're not just hurting uh, your testimony for the cause of Christ and hurting the, uh, and bringing reproach in the name of our Savior, but you're hurting yourself. Uh, look at Psalm 66, <clears throat> verse number 18. Psalm 66, verse number 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now, if God's not going to hear me, I'm certainly not going to hear him. So God said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the word regard means to cling to, to hold on to. To cling to, to hold on to. You justify it, you excuse it, you coddle it, you, make, you, 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 know, you adorn it, you, you feed it, you nourish it, uh, you water it, you, you care for it, you, don't, you defend it, uh, you take care of it, you regard it. Then it goes on the word iniquity. Uh, doesn't encompass just any sin. Iniquity is that sin that you know is there and you stubbornly refuse to deal with it. You, you don't want it gone. Uh, you like it and uh, you don't want it removed. And God said, if, you've got, if you regard iniquity in your heart, God says, I'm not going to hear you. I'm not going to hear you. And don't expect to hear my voice. And, uh, oh, there's a lot of voices that will come across as though uh, it's a voice of God. But God says, if there's things in your heart and things in your life that need to be dealt with, it's not God's voice that's, uh, that's telling you what, you what you think maybe that you're hearing uh, from God. And so there's a difference between a Christian who sins and a Christian who willfully and habitually sins without any desire to get in victory over that sin. Uh, we're all sinners. I talk about that at the Lord's Supper. Let a man examine himself. And it's a time to examine your heart, examine your life. Uh, we're all a work in progress. We're all trying to make progress. But that regarding iniquity, it's a difference between a Christian sinning and a Christian defending that sin, holding that sin, have no desire to get victory over that sin, has no anticipation at all to want to uh, move forward beyond that sin, and uh, there's no desire at all uh, to find progress in that area of his life. And so he willfully and habitually sins. There's no remorse. There's no sorrow. There's no sadness. There's no guilt. His heart's become hardened. Uh, he's become indifferent to the things of God. And uh, what's happened? He's allowed that thing to fester inside and God said, I'm not going to hear you. And you're certainly not going to hear from God. And, and God said, uh, you'll hear the chasing of God. And the only thing that God will hear from you is God. Be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm sorry. And God says, I'll hear that. And uh, God will draw nigh to us at those times. Uh, here's another verse. Take your Bibles and go to Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 15, Solomon reemphasized uh, David's words here. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 29, he says, uh, The Lord is far from the wicked. But he heareth the prayer of the righteous. God hears the prayer of the righteous. So here's what I tell folks. I say, if, you if you've got a prayer that's important for you to, to have answered, then the more righteous of a life that you live, the more godly of a life that you live, the more leverage you have with God in your praying. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, James says, availeth much. 
And so if you want to get a hold of God, and it's not just a prayer you want to pray, God said, I'll hear the prayer of a righteous man, someone that's trying to live right and to do right. If you've got something you need done and a miracle in your life, then God says, live righteously and live godly and live holy. And that gives you leverage and gives you the, the, the wherewithal to get a hold of the throne of God and says, God, now come on, do a work here and uh, work your power, do a miracle. Why? Because God says, I hear Someone that's living a righteous life and uh, doing the things that honor me and please me. And then let me get a, one other verse here, Isaiah uh, in 59. Isaiah 59, last part of Isaiah there. Look in Isaiah 59 and uh, verses number 1 and verse number 2. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. Isaiah 59. So uh, if I'm going to hear the voice of God, i got to leave L, leave the noise uh, behind. i got to incline uh, my heart unto God. I need to submit my thoughts. I can't have a vote. Uh, what do you want to do? I don't, I don't have any uh, opinion. I have no uh, vote. Why? Because I want to submit. I don't want what my hand can pull out of the candy jar. I want what God's hand can pull out of the candy jar. So you submit your thoughts. I, I'm just a, a blank page where I yield myself to God. I've signed the paper and it says, God, you fill in the blanks. And you trust what God gives. And that's what Jesus said. Not my will, but thy will be done. And then you turn from your sin. Turn from your sin. Look at Isaiah 59, verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. There's nowhere you can go that God won't come and get you. Neither is ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. God said, I'm not going to hear uh, you. And if, I, if I'm not, you're not going to hear, uh, hear from God, God said, I'm not going to hear you. Then obviously we're not going to be able to hear from God. But again, the key is what? That sin, that iniquity, that, that habitual sin, that willful sin, that sin without remorse, that sin that you excuse, that sin you have no desire to get victory over and uh, defend it. And so until we confess and deal with that sin, then you're not going to hear the voice of God. And so the first step, and it's, it's God, what, what area? Search me. Know me. What it try me? What's the things of my life? Next one, letter E. Go to Psalm 119. We're almost done. Psalm 119. I'll hurry up. Psalm 119. Look in verse number 18. <clears throat> verse number 19. The acronym, listen, uh, the word E, E. You've got to engage yourself in Scripture. You've got to engage, E, engage yourself in Scripture. Psalm, 19, Psalm 119. And look in verse number 18. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. Hey, you can read the Bible, and if you don't want to hear from God's word and you don't embrace the word of God, uh, God can hide his promises and his word right in front of you. And so you have to have a heart's desire to say, I want to engage. What you show me in your word, God, I'm going to apply it. Uh, what you show me in your word, God, I'm going to put it to practice. I'm going to activate your word. I'm not just reading my Bible to say I've read my Bible today. I'm reading the Bible to engage the word of God. I want you to open my eyes so I can see some wonderful things in your word. He said, I'm a stranger. Don't hide your commandments from me because your commandments are given to be obeyed. And when they're obeyed, the blessings come as a result of the obedience of those commandments. You see, when you read the Bible, you see the mind of God. You read the mind of God. When you listen to the word of God, you hear the voice of God. To hear God's voice, you've got to spend undistracted time in the Bible. You've got to engage yourself in the Bible. You've got to allow the Bible, when you spend time with it, to say, God, God wants to speak to you through his word. And every time you read the Bible, there's something he wants to tell us. But if we just sort of pick and choose what we want to hear from the Bible, then God's not going to reveal to us uh, what we've not already not done. And God's waiting for us to do what he told us to do yesterday before he tells us something else to do uh, today. And so he says, I want you to hear the word of God. The Bible uh, is like, you know, uh, even though a piano tuner uh, has an excellent ear for music, he still uses a tuning fork. Uh, one of the fellows that have been coming for years and tunes the piano, he's got these tuning instruments. And uh, he'll tune the piano. He's got an ear. He could come in and probably get it you know, right there to the, the, where it ought to be. But even the experts say, you know what, I can make a mistake and he has a tuning fork and that tuning fork uh, on our uh, guitars I never have used one Nathan have used, has used it for the guitar and I've used it since then uh, but it's an app you can put uh, on your phone and you hit the, the top note and it, it gives you the thing where you're supposed to be and you tune it up and all the way down and, uh, and so you can think it sounds in tune 
But that tuning fork, that tuning app, gets you right online. Uh, you can think you're in tune with God, but the tuning fork of God's Word lets you know how in tune that you really are and how in line to the Word of God, sort of like we've had on that word, incline our ear. Uh, let me give you this verse. This is a really a neat verse. Uh, go to Luke chapter 24. Sort of like the disciples that traveled on the road to Emmaus, the Lord revealed Himself through Scripture. God always reveals Himself through Scripture. Uh, nature itself, we know, proves there's a God. And, uh, but notice what it says here in Luke chapter 24 and verse number 27. Luke 24, verse number 27. So these disciples are walking the road to Emmaus. Jesus joins up alongside of them. And uh, Luke 24, 27 says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, expounded unto them, the two men that were traveling the road to Emmaus, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Notice what he said. I like those two words, concerning himself. But notice what he used, to how he explained himself. He said he expounded in them all the scriptures concerning himself. This book makes God's uh, alive. This book uh, makes it real to us. This book brings a real, realization uh, to us. And so we learn God reveals himself to us through the word of God. And so you won't know God apart from the word of God. And Jesus and they went to Mo, the, day, the books of Moses and went back and expounded in him the scriptures, everything that had to do with him, the Passover lamb and all the, all the things that we're dealing with, they thought were just traditions and, and sacrifices. They all pertain unto him. And so as you read your Bible, uh, listen for the Spirit of God to draw your attention to a certain passage, to spark a curiosity about maybe something you've read and to further research it, to give you an understanding of what you've read, to convict you of some things that need changing in your life. And then lastly, let me give the letter N. N, and we'll be done. That's the notice the nudgings of God. Notice the nudgings of God. God nudges us. God nudges us. In Psalm 25, 3 and 4, the Bible says, Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth. And teach me. For thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. He says, you know what? I'm waiting for that nudge from God. That nudge comes from. You know, in our lives, we all experience nudges throughout our day. Uh, the, the, the challenge is finding out, is that nudge of the flesh? Is that nudge of God? Uh, is that a nudge of the Spirit of God drawing me to, to do something or to contact someone or to text someone or to encourage someone? Or is that a nudging that's of the flesh and uh, of carnal in nature? How do we know if an unexpected nudging to do something comes from the Lord? Well, I think there are several things that we can do, to, questions that we can ask to find out that nudging is from God as you wait on God. Uh, the first thing I think it uh, deals with the providential uh, area of God, and that's this. Does a door open or do you have to knock the door down? Does the door open or are you having to force this thing? Uh, you know, sometimes we force God's will and we force it. We've all been guilty of it. And that we so much want to do what we want to do because we have a vote in what we want to do that the door doesn't open. It's something we crash down. Uh, so the providence of God. God's nudges never goes against his wisdom and uh, common sense. It doesn't go against that at all. Next one is the enemy. The enemy. Ask yourself this question. What do you suppose the devil would want you to do? If the devil had a vote in what you would do at this juncture and transition time or this crossroad of your life, what would the devil advise you to do? Because he's there advising you. The old flesh is trying to get his point across. And, and so if you can back up and say, well, of these decisions, which would the devil want you to choose? Well, probably this one. Then why are you going that direction? Why are you choosing God's word? Uh, is there anything in the Bible that would prohibit what you're feeling or what you're planning to do? Uh, plenty of well-meaning people believe themselves to have a hotline to God, but it all must be tested with Scripture. We must make sure it's always in line with that authority of God's word. Then lastly, faith. Faith. So we've got providence, enemy, authority, faith. Does your faith increase or decrease at the thought of doing this? You see, following through on a divine nudge is often an answer to someone else's prayer. Following through on a divine nudge is often an answer to someone's prayer. Someone's praying and that nudge comes to you 
And as you walk with God, then that nudge follow through becomes an answer to someone's prayer. And so is it something that strengthens your faith? Is it something that challenges your faith? Is it something that grows your faith? Uh, is it something not? So uh, we want to be very careful. God does. We want to listen. And if we're still in learning in this journey of life how to hear the voice of God, then you'll hear the nudgings of God. I often think when God wakes you up and, and you're thinking about someone, uh, that's a nudging of the Spirit of God. You better pray for that person. Often I'll wake up at nighttime and, and yours or others' names will come to my mind and, and I'll just take that moment. Dear God, would you please help them? And I don't know what they're going through in their life. Not necessarily that they need intercession right then because they're in a dangerous pot right there in their life uh, at 3 in the morning or whatever else. But, but there's some things in their heart and life that I want to pray for them about. And that's a nudging of the Spirit of God. And, and so we want to be aware and listen uh, to those things. Thank you, Father, for tonight. Uh, we do pray.